Yes, Puneet. Oh. Okay, so good afternoon. So uh, I think uh, we are ending uh, week seven, and I was going through a lot of discussion which are happening each week, and I'm so happy to see that each day there are more than two hundred messages, question answers, which are being uh, done on the app. So at this point, I would like to welcome all the faculty of the week. We have Dr. Ali Malu, Teju. We have, uh, in addition, Parsi, Ankita, Miraj from Jodhpur. Who else is there? Who has joined? Pratima. Yeah, right now uh, uh, these people have joined. So we are expecting uh, Dr. Shri Ram and uh, Dr. Sai Sunil also to join. Dr. Sai Sunil's name is there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I said that. So yes. we are going to have a short presentation by Parnati's team on the art and practice of CPAP. And after that, we will take few of the questions which are repeatedly asked in the app. So over to you, uh, Parsi and Ankita. Thank you, sir. Uh yeah, uh, in this whole week, uh, we are very happy that we saw so much of discussions from many of the participants. Most of the participants have responded. Uh, now, just I wanted to summarize in the whole week uh, what we had learned and uh, what we had discussed in this week. Yeah. Coming to the objectives, uh, uh, we had learned that what is CPAP? And what are the essentials of CPAP? Indications, contraindications, how we'll initiate the CPAP for an uh, baby with RD. And on the baby, uh, after <coughs> starting CPAP, how you'll monitor and what how you'll maintain for a better CPAP. And in cases of like a baby, if it is not maintaining otherwise, uh, baby had some other underlying causes, underlying sickness, if any uh, chances of failure is there, and what are the chances, and uh, how we uh, so we will identify the troubleshoot of the CPAP and also and uh, surfactant therapy uh, and the role of antenatal steroids, supportive care and prevention of ROP. Coming to CPAP, CPAP is a simple, non-invasive and uh, first, first line of respiratory support for the preterm babies and also term babies with RD. Uh, it also acts as a supportive care and it is an alternative therapy for intubation. Uh, Coming to the essentials of CPAP, uh, pressure, FIO2, low, and humidification. These are the essentials which are present in the CPAP. Coming to CPAP, CPAP is nothing but pressure that we are giving to the baby, and the pressure is 4 to 8 centimeters. Uh, above, beyond 8 and below 4, we won't go because it won't give uh, healthy pressure for the baby. Next, uh, in FIO2, uh, what is the range of FIO2 that we are giving for the baby? Uh, we are starting from 21% till 70% 70, 70 we are giving to the baby. Uh, next, flow and humidification. Uh, as a dry uh, oxygen in an oxygen cylinder, oxygen will, be happy, oxygen will be in the state of dry, cold and any um, but in a CPAP, we are giving the baby uh, oxygen, which is that is the reason that why we are using a CPAP. In CPAP, we are giving a not only a simple oxygen, we are, give, we are blending it with the air, uh, how much percent of O2 we, are, we wanted to give, we are blending it. Along with the blended O2, we are regulating the flow and also we are warming that air in order to give it to the baby. What are the indications that we are giving uh, CPAP? In, in the indications are spontaneous, the baby should having is, have a spontaneous breath, 
uh, baby should have spontaneous efforts for breathing. Then only a CPAP can be initiated um, for a preterm baby and also respiratory distress more than silver band score more than and in recurrent arrhythmias and also after the post excavation. And indications in term and term baby for babies who are having the, who are presenting with pneumonia and also MAS, pneumonia mastication syndrome or pneumonia. And the contraindication for which babies we cannot give the CPAP. Babies who are have, who are not having any respiratory efforts or otherwise having poor respiratory efforts. Babies who are with some congenital uh, diseases like congenital disorders like congenital diaphragmatic hernia, tracheal esophageal fistula, and babies with severe cardiovascular instability or otherwise monitoring and uh, coming to some of the congenital defects like have palate and clonal attrition. In those cases, we can't uh, initiate CPAP. And coming to the initiation of CPAP, how we can start a CPAP? We can start a CPAP by the rule of five and also before starting the CPAP, every baby should be connected to a pulse oximeter. But, uh, after connecting to the pulse oximeter, fix the capsize Correct appropriate size of cap size to be taken, right size of prongs, interface and device, these should be chosen correctly. And also before connecting, we have to check the complete circuit, that there are no leaks in the circuit. Uh, here uh, we are showing a um, complete uh, picture of the circuit, that there are no leaks and connected properly to the baby. And the baby also should be well, well supported. This is rule of five. Uh, we already discussed in our uh, uh, presentations and also throughout the week we discussed on this how the rule of five should be started. Any baby, if we are initiating uh, uh, CPAP means firstly they should take keep a peep of five flow of five liters and FIO to ranging from 30 to 50 percent. This is a monitoring chart. How we are monitoring after starting a CPAP? on what aspects and what criteria and all the things what we are monitoring heart rate, respiratory rate, amount of retractions, CFT, keep all those what are what all the things that we are monitoring for a baby which was kept on CPAP. Next coming to troubleshooting of CPAP. Uh, uh, based on the SPO2, retractions, air entry and bubbling and diagnosis. On this basis how we are uh, on what basis uh, retractions or movements, what has to be increased or what, what, what has to be changed in the CPAP. If retractions are both, will be altering the pressure of the CPAP. That means it has to be altered, otherwise titrated. Coming to the bubbles, if there are no bubbles in the bubble chamber, then we are titrating the flow. Flow should be adequate. Next, coming to the monitoring of airway. In monitoring of airway and uh, how the airway should be there as we are giving high flow of oxygen to the baby's uh, uh, lungs otherwise through the nostrils. So uh, how this nostril should be, care of the nostril should be maintained. Uh, whenever, uh, how, how, in, how frequently we have to keep the nasal saline, uh, saline water into the nostrils and how frequently we have to monitor baby's uh, interface, everything we have discussed throughout the week. Next, coming to the adequacy of CPAP, that means uh, whether the baby is comfortable on the uh, CPAP or not, what all the things that we are uh, maintaining and what all we are missing, this has to be maintained throughout our shift and uh, throughout the week everyone has uh, responded very uh, appropriately and aptly and like uh, they, they are how much care they are taking, we had noticed so much. Next, uh, coming to the failure of CPAP, if the baby after starting CPAP also, if there are uh, babies continuing in retractions and grunt and recurrent apneas are there and if baby is not tolerating on the CPAP, if otherwise SPO2 is less than, maintaining less than 85%, uh, if otherwise requirement of FIO2 is there more than 60%, then uh, we consider it as failure of CPAP and uh, other treatment modalities might be considered at the point of time. Next, other kind of reasons for the, for, on what uh, baby we may consider the failure of the CPAP system. Worsening of the baby like respiratory, cardiovascular, and neurological, and uh, uh, intubation, otherwise uh, anything will be uh, discussed at the point of time. Next, coming to the other next point we discussed in this week, surfactant administration. Uh, surfactant administration is uh, given on three uh, three methods. One is insure, LISA, and mist. Insure is intubated, intubation, surfactant, and 
extubation. Lisa is less invasive subcutaneous administration. And coming to MIST, MIST is uh, minimal invasive subcutaneous therapy. Uh, initially, we used to do only inshift, but in this uh, recent days, uh, many of the tertiary care centers mostly they are following this Lisa and MIST. And we, we got many, like uh, many people has asked about Lisa and this, then they had uh, given a feedback, nice feedback on this Lisa and this also. Uh, antenatal steroids uh, and role of the antenatal steroids are uh, very helpful for the uh, preterm baby and it helps, the, uh, it helps the baby in recovering, in not landing up in RD. Coming to the supportive care, what are the developmental supportive care we are giving along with the CPAP care means uh, ongoing assessment. On the baby side, we are monitoring the baby first, coming to uh, system interface and also the CPAP circuit. Uh, that we are ensuring that there are no leaks in the CPAP circuit. Coming to the airway, uh, there should be uh, yeah, there should be proper airway monitoring as we seen in the previous slide. Uh, there should be like installing uh, nasal drops, otherwise normal saline drops in like every three to four hours, so that the nostrils are not dried up. And coming to the third point, troubleshooting of bubble CPAP. Uh, what all the mistakes that we are doing, like anything that any leak is there in the system, this has to be monitored and identified and corrected immediately, so that we may not land up with a CPAP failure. Coming to the developmental supportive care. In this developmental supportive care, mainly the main points are nesting, involvement of the mother care, and uh, CPAP and KMC both are very much helpful to, uh, for the baby, and also mother's milk. Own mother's milk is much more helpful in this uh, developmental supportive care, and also that avoiding loud noises, bright lights to the baby. This may help it for the baby, which is more irritable and on the CPAP system. And coming to the last thing, pain relief, positioning, and feeding. Prevention of ROP. Uh, as ma'am discussed in the brain in the video which was given in our content, uh, management of RD, if, if we are uh, managing properly uh, and if we are giving the appropriate oxygen to the baby, it will reduce ROP. ROP is completely mm -hmm. a preventable thing. And if we are on proper monitoring basis, if we are monitoring the pulse oximetry and whatever the oxygen which we are giving to the baby, if we are monitoring it correctly. Definitely, ROP is a preventable thing, and uh, we may not see any baby going into blindness. Uh, and careful use of food oxygen. Whatever we are giving the oxygen, as oxygen is a drug, so it has to be monitored and under monitoring only we have to administer the baby. Target SpO2 is 90 to 95%. We should, uh, baby should not go above 95% when the baby is on oxygen. Severe hypoxemia or uh, hypoxia, hyperoxia, both will affect the baby and will cause a, a more major damage to the baby. Take home messages. As we discussed the whole week, the CPAP is, uh, is only for a spontaneous breathing infants, which babies are having uh, respiratory efforts. And feet can be based on the retractions of the baby and on the chest X-ray. How much lung spaces are present in the X-ray? Uh, based on that, we'll be adjusting the feet. Coming to FIO2, uh, uh, based on the FIO2, SPO2 of the baby, FIO2 can be titrated. Coming to the uh, flow, flow can be titrated based on the bubbling. The minimal flow can be kept as 4 liters, maximum till 8 liters. And monitoring of the baby interface and circuit. We have to monitor on this base of these three aspects baby, interface, and circuit. Meaning of Meaning of FIO2 and PEEP. Uh, we discussed on this how we can wean off the FIO2, how we can reduce the PEEP. It can be reduced by one step, one, one centimeter decrease. Like that, we can reduce the PEEP. Failure is uncommon, and we have to maintain a checklist which, uh, for a baby who is on CPAP. CPAP works better if it is used early. And also, CPAP works better if it is preceded by surfactant. Because uh, CPAP, we know that we had understood and we had learned that CPAP works well and also surfactant also work, works well. So that's why we are uh, suggesting that otherwise it is proven that early surfactant followed by CPAP is better than delayed surfactant and, and landing of a baby in a mechanical ventilation. Thank you. <coughs> can, can you. Can you stop sharing your screen, please? Yes, sir.
stop sharing your screen here. Yeah. Okay, so so thank you uh, for this nice summary. Thank you, sir. For the week and uh, to most of the participant. See, while we are talking of CPAP, remember one thing. That reality which which works synergistically, if you provide here and you use antenatal corticosteroid. I think we should not go at if you are starting CPAP, all babies with RDS will need surfactant also. I think this is a misnomer. If you give antenatal corticosteroid, you provide good delivery room care and early CPAP nearly 60 or 70 percent of babies will not require surfactant also. So a lot of people start thinking if I have to use CPAP, I need to have surfactant. I think we need to get away from this misconception, providing good delivery room care and using early CPAP and use of antenatal corticosteroids for below 34 weeks will do all the justice. Second thing is, while you are monitoring a baby on CPAP, there are three things you monitor. First is you monitor the baby by vital signs, looking at distress, Silverman scoring, how the baby is doing or improving or not. Second is you monitor the interface of the baby, which is a junction through which you give CPAP. And the third is you monitor the machine. Machine includes your blender, humidification system, and the bubbling system which is there in the CPAP. <clears throat> also, you have to make sure humidification is adequate. <clears throat> so, I don't think it is very difficult. Only thing is you have to understand this in simplified terms. And also remember, it is the work of a team which is involved. It is not individuals who can make the difference. Your team must be well aware about all these things. And also must be aware if they are using surfactant and CPAP, they must have a backup ventilation which has to be provided to the baby. Also make sure that your babies are not getting infected and hypothermic. So supportive care is very important because it deteriorates the baby. So it it is it is the duty of the consultant, the resident doctors and nurses, whoever is working there, to make sure you provide good holistic care to the baby. And also keep in mind, you talk to the family, family is aware what is happening and make sure the progress of the baby also is communicated to the family. So there are one, two common questions which are there, which I'll answer rather than asking people. One is someone is asking after doing IMV, if you have to shift to CPAP, should endotracheal tube should be used. Endotracheal CPAP is contraindicated, not to be used. You have to remove the AET tube and give the CPAP using an interface, which may be a prong, it may be a mask, which has to be used for providing CPAP, not endotracheal tube. There was another one question which is asked time and again is, you lower the CPAP to four and don't go below four. You know, physiologically, the newborn baby who has got distress, he developed CPAP by keeping the glutting area closed and a CPAP of nearly three centimeter is produced by the baby while the baby is breathing against the closed glottic area. And that is the reason the grunt is produced. The baby is trying to create more pressure to keep his alveoli open. So giving a CPAP pressure below four is not required most of the time. You start at five, get to maximum of seven as is discussed in your discussion. And while you are weaning off, come down on the FiO2 first and then on CPAP and at 4 CPAP with 30% FiO2, you can take that baby off from the CPAP and get to nasal prong or hood, whatever you have in your system for giving CPAP. So we talked, antenatal corticosteroids are very important. So let me ask Dr. Elimelu two questions on antenatal corticosteroid. If we use antenatal corticosteroid, how does it help the newborn 
baby that is why and what are the three extra indications for use of prenatal pump tell me hello so good morning sir uh, thank you so much for making me part of this uh, greatest endeavor that uh, we know of in neonatology so thank you so much sir and i'm so happy to see the interaction so we it's been proven beyond doubt in and every scientific evidence supports the use of antenatal corticosteroids like you've told it starts off so antenatally it can make a lot of difference in terms of reduction of rda for using antenatal corticosteroids yeah. so uh, we had so many doubts why when we were talking about antenatal steroids during uh, discussion whether it should be it can be given when a mother has diabetes whether the mother has uh, hypertension but i with it has been cre uh, clearly proven that it is still very safe and indicated in these conditions as well only thing is we need to monitor these uh, mothers very closely and the only known contraindication is chorioamnitis in the mother so only if there is an evidence of this infection by the definition of very high grade fever beyond 1 or 3 and then with leukocytosis with foul smelling like a, this is the only obvious indication of not giving corticosteroids otherwise it's very safe and it's proven uh, one course of it has been proven and it doesn't cause any neurodevelopmental effects as well so it can make a lot of difference in the survival so in your module in your module there is a flow now yes which sir. is based on comment of the line of use of antenatal what how do you monitor what is true labor what is a false labor and when you have to give what dose it has to be given okay yes, sir. so let me ask neeraj neeraj there are two three questions in your discussion which were happening can we give dexamethasone orally and iv rather than giving intramuscular neeraj as of now uh, good morning everyone and uh, thank you sir so as of now whatever the evidence is it is primarily in the lines of intramuscular dose so we stick to that protocol and continue with the intramuscular doses rather than going for iv or oral so the simple answer is it has to be given intramuscular intramuscular see it is before time it will take some time for the action on nemocyte to for production of surfactant which has to occur you cannot give this in the form of a bolus injection to the baby or give orally because then you are going to be unsure about how it is going to be absorbed and the side effect which may happen of vomiting and gastritis in the woman who is already pregnant so the recommended is deep intramuscular injection 6 mg every 12 hourly over 48 hours so that you give total of 24 mg of dexamethasone okay so don't try to play around and use the different routes for giving it it is not a experiment we are doing we have to use a practice which is a effective practice and as rightly said by lmlo if it is chorioaminitis that is only the contraindication no pih pih you can give diabetes you can give pet you can give but you have to monitor that woman you can't leave that mo mother unmonitored while you are giving for diabetes also while you are giving antenatal corticosteroids so remember that part and there there is another one question uh, which is there teju or shriram can answer if a baby is on cpap how many days you have to give this baby cpap and when we can wean this baby off from cpap teju or shriram Uh, good morning, sir. Shri Ram here. Bolo. Hey, you. Shri Ram, bolo. Yes, sir. So the you can continue the baby on CPAP as long as uh, it is needed. So if the baby needs CPAP, then um, there is no nothing like you have to give for a certain duration because in preterm babies, uh, the babies tend to even grow on CPAP also. So if there is a necessity, real necessity that you have to continue CPAP for a longer duration, yes, we can. there is no uh, time limit for that but as soon as the baby stabilizes there is no respiratory distress his fio2 comes down he is able to breathe normally then we can wean off the cpaps yeah so as shri ram is saying it is need based and it is contextual individualized treatment you may have a baby who is only 700 g 
he may require CPAP for a very long duration. So, because he may be having apneic episode in between while you are removing the baby from CPAP. Okay. So, you have to monitor the baby very carefully. Keep the target oxygen saturation at 90 to 95 percent and try to see while the baby gets stabilized, everything is okay, that how you can wean the baby off. If you have continued CPAP for a longer duration, four weeks or five weeks on a baby, then sometimes it becomes very difficult for this baby to be weaned off. At this point of time, there are no clear guidelines how that baby will be weaned off. There can be periods of you can remove the CPAP for four hours and then re-put the baby on CPAP in one shift or maybe in a day, then do it on two shifts and then gradually increase the duration and then the baby will learn how he is going to be off CPAP, okay? So I think these decisions are, we can't teach you through the bookish knowledge. This is art and practice. It has to be learned in the unit with the team. Team is not you alone. You cannot take decisions on your alone. It has to be with your doctors, with the other staff nurses, and maybe medical officers who are with you. So all these things should be kept in mind while you have to take a decision that this baby can be off CPAP, okay? Because we have seen babies for months together on CPAP. And then it becomes difficult for them to get from out from CPAP. It all depends. The baby may have landed up with a chronic lung disease and he's oxygen dependent or maybe pressure dependent for some time because his lung is too compliant. It, it caves in while you remove the CPAP. So in that situation, individual decision will be taken. But large majority, if your babies are about 1250 grams and baby is on CPAP and with surfactant, without surfactant insured, hopefully over next five days, seven days, you will be able to remove that baby. But again, it varies on from one baby to the other baby. Keep that in mind. So there is another one question which is there, uh, Neeraj. People are asking, uh, how safe is indigenous CPAP? And what are the drawbacks of indigenous CPAP? Neeraj? Yes, sir. So, uh, remember that I think uh, we have amply discussed about all the components of CPAP. So, CPAP is not only the pressures or the FiO2. So, the problem with the indigenous CPAP is that on one hand, we don't have the blenders, you are giving 100% oxygen. So, all of us are very well aware now that what are the drawbacks of giving so much oxygen, which is going to cause toxicity and all problems like ROPs, bronchopulmonary dysplasias, NECs, IVH, PVL. So that is one of the biggest problems. So we, whatever machine we take, we need to have a blender so that you can titrate your uh, oxygen concentration or FiO2, which you are giving. That is one problem. Second problem with the indigenous CPAP is that <clears throat> the, the, there is no proper way to humidify and warm the gases. So this is another major component of any CPAP machine when we buy that there has to be a humidifier and a warmidifier. So which means that you have a humidifier which is giving the gases which is uh, increasing the relative humidity to 100% at 37 degrees Celsius and warming the gases. So problem with the indigenous CPAP is that the gases are, are cold and when these cold gases which are again unhumidified or dried, they go through your respiratory passage. It causes a lot of uh, insensible losses. It causes a lot of drying of the secretions. And once we know that when these secretions are going to dry up in your airway, right from your nose and nasopharynx right up to the alveoli. So air becomes narrow, so your resistance will increase. So if the resistance is going to go up, your work will increase and chances of CPAP failure will be more. Simultaneously, as it <clears throat> keeps on going down, your alveoli will start getting collapsed. So initially you may find that once you have started CPAP, indigenous CPAP, the babies improves. But after some time, because of these complications, babies have deteriorated and it invites infections. So uh, we need to be very sure that when we talk of CPAP or any kind of CPAP, these two components have to be there. They are must blenders as well as your uh, humidifier. And needless to say that though pulse oximeter is not a part of CPAP, but then it is, it is an inherent part of that because you need to monitor your saturations and keeping a target of 90 to 95. Otherwise, you will cause more problem rather than causing good to the baby. So as Neeraj rightly said, Indigenous CPAP, unless you are regulating oxygen, you end up in giving 100% oxygen and that also is a dry oxygen. So it may do more harm to the baby rather than doing good to the baby. 
so if you are in your unit there are a lot of babies who are coming with respiratory distress they die due to rest it is better you ask the administration to put cpap machine there get yourself trained and then as a team try to use that for babies early rather than using late in your unit okay so i know these problems are there everywhere and it, these may be system related equipment related problem which are there but use of indigenous cpap at this point of time i would say is not uh, like uh, ethical also because you, the harm of giving oxygen is there in the baby baby may land up in complication and other complications which are not related to oxygen also may happen to a baby if you are using indigenous cpap so humidification is a part and parcel of cpap machine using blended oxygen is part and parcel and then you have to monitor that by using a pulse oximeter because at this point of time if you are working on a preterm baby you give oxygen you don't monitor it baby has rop and no screening done other thing done i think we are in a soup that that unit is in going to be in problem for uh, uh, there may be uh, legal issues which may crop in okay so keep that in mind so try to talk to your doctors that uh, indigenous cpap is not a good thing they need to have a good uh, cpap machine in the unit to be used now let me ask uh, teju teju also is there and uh, first to ankita ankita yes, tell us uh, tell us why the baby is on cpap and you are using a prong which is hudson prong how do you monitor the nasal injury in the baby ankita yes sir how do you monitor in each shift or after how many hours you look for yes sir so i think again it is very important to monitor the baby for skin injury and also make sure while you are using the prong it should not be very tight fitting prong there has to be a gap between the nostrils small amount of gap and then tagadam is put and then it is not touching the the bridge of the nose straight away like that so i think there is a poster which is there there is a video also which is there which is there in your module try to use it appropriate while you are using different types of prongs it may be a argel prong it may be a romson prong or it may be a hudson a face mask so whatever you are you are using you have to monitor the baby for skin injury okay and uh, while you are looking for skin injury you will have to disconnect so temporary disconnection does not lead to any problem you don't need to see whether there is injury or not okay 
so temporarily for a few seconds you can do that and do the assessment and make sure the baby skin is and the columella is not uh, uh, injured in the baby now let me ask teju one question teju we have fixed the baby on cpap machine and the bubbling system what should be the level of the bubbling system and how should the bubble look like should they be very fast bubble or during inspiration and expiration or only in one phase um, thank you sir teju yes so level should be <coughs> there is a mark in all the chambers up to what level we have to keep the water and uh, second thing is that bubbles should be just adequate to be there in the both the phases that is both in the inspiration and expiration it need not be that completely we have to hear from the distance that the bubbling sound is there for the baby they have to be just adequate to the bubbling only indicates that adequate flow is there to keep the peep required for the baby that's it uh, that's what we will be able to know from the bubble hello okay so as teju said while you are looking at the bubbles number one is the the tube which is under water it should be like 5 cm okay second is the bubbles which should come should be both during inspiration and during expiration they should not be too fast like one after the other they are coming like this that means your flow rate is very high so if your flow rate is high the delivered pressure will be much higher than what 5 cm you wanted to give that is one second is if you find the bubbles are coming only while the baby is expiring out expiration and not during inspiration during inspiration no bubbles that means you are not giving a adequate flow also of the to the patient and due to that the baby is not going to have even that 5 cm which you wanted so the bubble should be both during inspiration and both during expiration slowly slowly it should not be very fast like this and it should not be that due during okay so make sure while you are looking at the bottle it is capped <clears throat> below the level of the baby and you look at the bubbles which are there both during inspiration and expiration and then make sure if someone is doing auscultation you are able to hear those bubbles which are getting during inspiration and expiration through the bottle very important so <clears throat> so i think uh, who else is there i think everyone has been asked one 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 question and uh, i was so happy to see all the and majority of the questions which are here in the chat box we have already answered them and uh, there is one question that yeah good morning sir cpap you are from cpap do you have to get to hfmc or not you can remove the baby from cpap directly to oxygen by nasal prong or a hood straight away there is no need that you start asking ki mereko to hffnc machine bhi chahiye okay so you can work only with cpap baby can be extubated to room air or nasal prong but if you have hffnc okay surely people will like to put the baby on hffnc so sai you joined late i think we had a lot of discussions which were there so just uh, tell one or two messages which you would like to give to people because we are winding up now sai yes sir uh, uh, sorry for the delay yeah. there was some uh, emergency in the unit so that's why no uh, issue give two messages two important messages for use of cpap yeah uh, can't hear you okay so we are not able to hear but i i am very sure he will say when you are using cpap use it early and use antenatal corticosteroid do good delivery with care and then you can avoid yeah, most yeah. of the even the use of cpap. so wonderful and i think week 7 has gone really very well i was so happy to see all the discussions which are happening we will have a quiz now which will start today evening today evening or tomorrow prathima over to you
Yes, sir. Tomorrow Fatima. will be. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, tomorrow, tomorrow will be starting. Yes, sir. Tomorrow, sir. And if people have question, they will still keep on asking. You. Yes, yes. You can keep on posting the questions for the next two days, and we'll open the quiz tomorrow morning. Uh, yes, sir. Thank so you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming for uh, this uh, weekly and which is normally thirty-five or forty-minute session in which we take summary and uh, questions. And I'm so happy that looking at the success of how the course has gone for nurses, we are going to start with a course which is going to be for fellows, for resident doctors, DCI doctors, and even uh, SNCU's doctor who will get uh, into learning the course. Okay, and we will need help of all the faculty members who are involved at this point of time to run uh, to run the next course, which is going to be e-course for doctors. Thank you.